Chapter 24, Caring for Clients with Valve Disorders of the Heart. Learning Objectives. List five disorders that commonly affect heart valves. Discuss assessment findings among patients with valve disorders. Name three diagnostic tests used to confirm valve disorders. Identify consequences of valve disorders. Name five categories of drugs used to treat valve disorders. Give two examples of treatments other than drug therapy to correct valve disorders and discuss nursing management of clients with valve disorders. Heart structures. There are four cardiac valves, aortic, mitral, tricuspid, and pulmonic. Structures can be affected by malformations at birth, inflammatory and infectious disorders, age-related degeneration, structural damage after an MI, or injury from intracardiac procedures. The left side of the heart contains the aortic and mitral valves. The right side of the heart contains the pulmonic and tricuspid valves. The left side of the heart has higher pressure than the right side. Disorders of the aortic valve. The aortic valve has three cusps and is described as semilunar because each cusp appears like a half moon. The left ventricle pumps blood from the heart through the aortic valve. When the left ventricle contracts, an, a fully functioning aortic valve opens to allow the unrestricted passage of oxygenated blood into the arterial vascular system. The coronary arteries supply the myocardium or heart muscle are the first blood vessels perfused with oxygen and blood. After ejection of left ventricular blood, the aortic valve closes tightly to prevent backflow of blood. Two valve conditions interfere with, with unidirectional blood flow from the left side of the heart, aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Aortic stenosis means narrowing of the opening in the aortic valve when the valve cusp becomes stiff and rigid. It's a common valvular disorder in the U.S., especially among older adults. In older adults without predisposing, predisposing cardiac conditions, narrowing of the aortic valve is age-related from progressive calcium deposits in valve cells. In young adults, aortic stenosis usually is a later consequence of a congenital defect in which the valve has two instead of three cusps. At birth and throughout childhood, this defect does not produce symptoms. Symptoms appear after several decades when the same calcification process that affects older adults causes the valves to harden. In others, aortic stenosis results directly from valve damage related to rheumatic carditis and infective endocarditis. The stiff calcified valve cannot open properly and needs more force to push blood through its narrowed opening. The muscular wall of the left ventricle enlarges and thickens as a result, hypertrophies. The blood volume passing through the narrowed valve eventually becomes insufficient to nourish the heart and other organs. Exercise or any circumstance that increases heart rate can cause myocardial ischemia, affecting the heart's ability to contract effectively. Left-sided left -sided heart failure may develop because the heart cannot fully empty during systole and becomes more fatigued as it tries to overcome the resistance created by the narrowed valve. Should the adult with aortic stenosis develop coronary artery disease and an MI, the infarct may enlarge. Risk of mortality thus increases because of the valve's compromised ability to perfuse the myocardium with oxygen. Age-related effects such as stiffening of the aorta and calcification and fibrotic thickening of the mitral and aortic valves contribute to the development of symptoms such as increased systolic blood pressure, dangerous arrhythmias, or too fast or too slow, or sometimes referred to as dysrhythmias, and complications such as increased myocardial oxygen demand, heart failure, and alterations in cardiac output in the older adult with valve heart disease. Assessment findings. A client with aortic nursing management. The nurse monitors subjective and objective symptoms and explains the purposes and techniques of diagnostic tests. 
He or she then administers prescribed medications and monitors for therapeutic or adverse responses and institutes measures to ensure adequate cardiac output and tissue oxygenation. The nurse assists the client to adhere to dietary modifications to reduce fluid volume and the work placed on the heart. Aortic regurgitation. Question. The nurse assesses the client diagnosed with aortic stenosis. On auscultation, the nurse assesses a grade 2 heart murmur. A description of this heart murmur includes A. A very loud murmur with a palpable thrill. B. A heart murmur that is moderately loud. C. A very quiet murmur that can be heard when auscultating the heart. Or D. A very faint murmur that may not be heard in all positions. The answer is C, a very quiet murmur that can be heard when auscultating the heart. The S2 heart sound is split, that is, there is a definite separation between the sounds of the aortic valve and pulmonic valve closing. Heart murmur grades. Heart murmurs are graded 1 through 6. Grade 1 is very soft and heard with difficulty. Grade 2 is a soft murmur, but it can be readily heard when auscultating the heart. Grade 3 is a murmur that is moderately loud. Grade 4 is a loud murmur accompanied by a palpable thrill of vibration felt on the chest wall. Grade 5 is very loud with a palpable thrill, but not audible without a stethoscope. Grade 6 is very loud with a palpable thrill. The murmur is heard with the stethoscope off the client's chest. Aortic regurgitation. This occurs when the aortic valve does not close tightly and blood can leak backward. The valve's inability to close tightly is a condition called valvular incompetence. Valvular incompetence can result from damage to the valve cusps or papillary muscles. It may be a consequence of various disorders such as rheumatic carditis, endocarditis, syphilis, age-related stretching of the proximal aorta, and systemic inflammatory conditions. In 1997, the incidence of aortic and mitral regurgitation increased as a result of the use of fenfluramine and fenteramine. That's known as fenfen. Fenfluramine alone and dexifluramine redux alone for weight loss. Various researchers identified that a significant percentage of clients who took these drugs developed valve disorders. Some of these drugs are no longer on the market, yet it does not mean they have no effect. Be sure and ask about historical use of medications as your client may have taken the drug when it was available. So the drugs are known as Fenfen or Redux. Nutrition notes. The client with a valvular heart, heart disorder. Clients with valve disorders often need to limit sodium intake because decrease in the volume of blood decreases cardiac workload. Because approximately 75% of sodium in the typical American diet comes from processed foods, encourage clients to substitute homemade foods for convenience products and commercially prepared items. Foods to avoid include canned fish, meat, poultry, soup, vegetables, and vegetable juices, smoked and processed meat, sauerkraut, commercial mixes, instant rice and pasta mixes, casserole mixes, frozen dinners, entrees, pizzas, and vegetables with sauces, most fast foods, condiments such as ketchup, relish, pickles, barbecue sauce, and soy sauce, and Worcestershire sauce and seasoning salts. Salt substitutes replace sodium with potassium or other minerals and they may taste bitter. Low sodium salt substitutes may contain up to half as much sodium as regular table salt. Clients should not use either type without a physician's approval. Clients with valvular disorders may need to restrict fluids because volume affects cardiac emptying. Foods that liquefy at room temperature such as ice cream, ice milk, gelatin, ice pops, and sherbet are counted as liquids when fluid intake is restricted. Aortic regurgitation continues. When blood is pumped through the incompetent aortic valve, some leaks backward, called valvular regurgitation, into the left ventricle. 
This backflow reduces cardiac output and causes fluid overload in the left ventricle, which becomes chronically stretched, hindering its ability to pump effectively. High fluid pressure in the left ventricle causes the mitral valve to shut early, which interferes with left atrial emptying. The blood in the left atrium backs up into the pulmonary circulation. Left ventricular en enlargement increases the heart's need for oxygen. When the coronary arteries cannot supply the heart muscle with enough oxygen because of decreased cardiac output, the heart muscle becomes ischemic and the client experiences chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath on exertion, confusion, and left ventricular failure may develop. Assessment findings. The client remains asymptomatic as long as the left ventricle can sustain adequate circulation. Tachycardia is one of the first signs of cardiac compensation. When valve damage affects the left ventricle, the client becomes aware of forceful heart contractions called palpitations. At first, palpitations occur only when lying flat or on the left side. In later stages, the client experiences dyspnea, shortness of breath, and chest pain. During physical exam, the skin may be flushed and moist, especially in the upper body. The radio pulse may be very strong with quick, sharp beats, followed by a sudden collapse of force, a characteristic called a water hammer pulse or Corrigan's pulse. Often pulse pressure is wide because systolic blood pressure tends to be extremely high, whereas diastolic blood pressure remains low or normal. The enlarged heart displaces the PMI, which is the point of maximum impulse on the heart, so it actually moves itself as a consequence of this, um, moves the position in the chest. The chest may heave or rock from the forceful contractions of the enlarged left ventricle. A heart murmur caused by the turbulence of blood falling back through the dilated aortic valve may also be heard. Diagnostic findings. Cardiac catheterization reveals high left ventricular pressure and backward movement of blood. A chest x-ray reveals heart enlargement and the aortic valve appears dilated. The EKG shows tall R waves, depressed ST segments indicating myocardial ischemia. A radionuclide scan comparing blood flow through the heart at rest and during exercise reveals the severity of the disease. Standard or transesophageal um, EKGs provide images of atypical, atypical valve and myocardial function. A CT or MRI may be performed if the echocardiographic images are inconclusive. Medical and surgical management. Because aortic regurgitation is mild and only slowing progressive in most people, slowly progressing, clients are sustained with cardiac glycosides or beta blockers and diuretics. When taken appropriately, prophylactic antibiotics prevent reoccurrence of, ineffect of infective endocarditis. Clients are advised to modify their lifestyle to avoid excessive demands on the heart, such as those that may result from strenuous exercise and emotional stress. Non-selective beta blockers can aggravate chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and contribute to hypertrophy excuse me, to hyperglycemia and insulin-dependent adults. Again, non-selective beta blockers can aggravate chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and contribute to hy hyperglycemia in insulin-dependent adults. Some diuretics deplete potassium, causing hypokalemia. Before giving beta blockers, take the client's apical pulse. If the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, do not give the drug and notify the primary health care provider. Closely monitor clients taking beta blockers for signs and symptoms of overdosage, such as bradycardia, severe dizziness, drowsiness, and bluish discoloration of the palms, fingernails, or both. Notify the primary health care provider immediately if these symptoms appear. When a client becomes symptomatic, replacement of the diseased aortic valve is considered. The less heart damage occurs before surgery, the better the outcome. If the aorta is diseased, the procedure is more involved because repair involves a vascular graft. Older adults may require lower, lower doses of cardiac glycosides than younger adults because of age-related metabolic changes. The more medicines older adults take, the more likely they are to have dangerous interactions. 
For older adults taking beta blockers, monitor the heart rate and blood pressure closely. The adverse effects of bradycardia and hypotension can cause confusion, falls, and ultimately death. Nursing management. The nurse prepares the client for diagnostic procedures and monitors response, responses in the patient, reporting changes in heart rate and rhythm, shortness of breath, chest pain, and loss of consciousness to the physician immediately. The nurse administers prescribed medicine and evaluates the client's response. Ensuring that physical activity is balanced according to the client's tolerance is important. Before discharge, the nurse explains the need for antibiotic therapy before medical and dental procedures and teaches how to assess blood pressure regularly as well as methods to control hypertension. Question, for which one of the following assessments should the nurse withhold a cardiac glycoside such as digoxin, called linoxin, when caring for a client with a valve disorder of the heart? A, the client's diastolic blood pressure is 80 millimeters mercury. B, the client's heart rate is 50 beats per minute. C, the client has an S2 heart sound. Or D, the client's heart rhythm is irregular. The answer is the client's heart rate is 50 beats per minute. Before administering digoxin, also called linoxin, the nurse must assess the pulse rate before each dose. Do not give if the pulse is less than 60 or greater than 120 beats per minute. Disorders of the mitral valve. The mitral valve, which lies between the left atrium and left ventricle, is a bicuspid valve. The two cusps are attached on the ventricular surface to strands of fibrous tissue called cordae tendinae, which are projections from papillary muscles. The papillary muscles contract in unison with the ventricle, pull on the cordae tendinae, and prevent the cusps from ballooning into the left atrium. The functions of the mitral valve are to open widely to allow oxygenated blood to fill the left ventricle and close tightly to prevent blood from re-entering the left atrium after the left ventricle is filled. As long as the mitral valve remains structurally sound, blood exits the left ventricle through the aortic valve, where the aorta, aorta receives a 50 to 70 milliliter bolus of oxygenated blood, referred to as the stroke volume. The valve may become rigid, which is stenotic, narrowing, incompetent, inadequate closure, or prolapsed, which is floppy. Mitral valve prolapse is the most commonly diagnosed valve disorder. Mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis means that the valve does not open properly to facilitate filling of the left ventricle. It is primarily a sequela, a condition that follows a disease, usually rheumatic carditis. Mitral stenosis worsens with each reoccurrence of endocarditis. The inflammation causes the cusp to stick together and form a thick, rigid, calcified scar at the commissures, the area where the cusps contact each other, and the cordae tendinae fuse and shorten. The mitral valve cannot open completely, leading to incomplete emptying of the left atrium. Pooled blood from incomplete emptying contributes to clot formation, which puts the client at risk for arterial, arterial emboli. The left atrium enlarges because it has to contract more forcibly to empty. Pressures from overfilling is conveyed backward through the blood vessels to the lungs, creating pulmonary hypertension and the potential for pulmonary edema. Pulmonary hypertension increases the work of the right ventricle as it pumps against the high pressure in the pulmonary vascular system. Because blood flows in a circuit, the, dis the disease on the left side of the heart eventually affects the right side. The right ventricle may enlarge in response to its increased workload. When the contraction of the right ventricle can no longer overcome the pulmonary resistance, right-sided heart failure develops. Excess blood accumulates in the venous circulation, the liver becomes congested with blood, and edema occurs in the legs. Assessment findings. It may take 20 to 40 years for a client who's had rheumatic fever to develop mitral stenosis. The normal valve opening is four to five cubic 
centimeters. Symptoms develop when the valve area is less than 2.5 cubic centimeters. At that time, clients report fatigue and shortness of breath after slight exertion. Symptoms become disabling approximately 10 years after onset. They are accentuated when unusual demands are placed on the heart, such as fever, emotional stress, or pregnancy. Later clients experience heart palpitations caused by tachyarrhythmias, which is rapid arrhythmias. With the onset of pulmonary hypertension, clients may become more short of breath or dyspneic at night and must sleep in a sitting position. They may develop a cough productive of pink, frothy sputum. Crackles heard in the bases of the lungs are a sign of pulmonary congestion. Changes in heart sounds may be the earliest indication of mitral valve stenosis. S1 may be extremely loud if the cusps are fused or muffled or absent, if the cusps have calcified and are not moving. A murmur described as sounding like a rumbling underground train can be heard at the heart's apex, especially when the client assumes a left lateral position. The systolic blood pressure is low from reduced cardiac output. If backward pressure through the pulmonary circulation is sufficient to affect the right ventricle, the client's face is flushed, neck vein distension is evident, the liver is enlarged, and there is peripheral edema. Pulmonary hypertension. Low systolic pressure is associated with pulmonary hypertension. A productive cough with pink-tinged, frothy sputum can indicate a progression of the disorder and a need for treatment. Diagnostic findings. A chest x-ray reveals an enlarged left atrium and mitral valve calcification. In advanced stages, evidence of fluid congestion in the lungs, called pulmonary edema, is found. A standard or esophageal echocardiogram demonstrates the decreased movement of the mitral valve cusps and the changes in the size of the atrial chamber. On EKG, the P wave is notched, showing that the left atrium takes longer to depolarize than the right atrium because of its increased size. Medical and surgical management. Antibiotic therapy is prescribed to prevent future episodes of infective endocarditis. Preventing or relieving the symptoms of heart failure is essential. A daily aspirin, dipyridamol, which is called persantine, or other oral anticoagulants may be ordered to avoid clot formation. Arrhythmias, which are abnormal electrical impulse transmission through the conduction system, such as atrial fibrillation, which is quivering of the atrial muscle with insufficient force to pump blood, are treated with drugs or cardioversion. Cardioversion stops the heart momentarily to allow the SA node to reestablish itself as the pacemaker. Commiserotomy is a surgical technique to separate the fused valve leaflets. However, not all clients with mitral stenosis are suitable candidates for surgery. Those whose condition is so slight that it does not cause symptoms or so severe of such long duration that profound changes in the heart and lungs have occurred usually are excluded. The earlier the surgery is performed, the greater the likelihood that it will relieve the symptoms. Percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty, also called valvotomy, is a non-surgical alternative. When percutaneous balloon valv valvuloplasty is performed, a catheter with an uninflated balloon is passed through the femoral vein and threaded into the right atrium. The septum is then punctured between the right and left atria. When the catheter is in the mitral valve, it is inflated. Clients are often discharged on the same day as the procedure. The atrial puncture allows some blood to shunt from the left atrium to the right, but the opening usually closes within six months. Complications, although rare, include mitral regurgitation, residual atrial septal defect, perforation of the left ventricle, embolization, and MI, heart attack. Management of the client after percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty includes the following. An echocardiogram within 72 hours to detect micro, mitral regurgitation, left ventricular dysfunction, or pronounced atrial septal defect. Also, oral anticoagulants therapy within one to two days for clients who have a history of atrial fib or instituted for others if atrial fib develops in the future. Prophylactic antibiotic protocols to prevent 
infective endocarditis, yearly medical follow-up that includes elect echocardiography, chest x-ray, and EKG. Nursing management. The nurse monitors the client's physical condition, prepares him or her for diagnostic testing, and provides post-treatment care. Discharge teaching includes information regarding drug therapy, activity modification, signs and symptoms of complications, and when to contact the physician. Mitral regurgitation, sometimes referred to as mitral insufficiency, occurs when the mitral valve does not close completely. Some clients present with severe acute symptoms. Others whose heart muscle increases in size to compensate remain asymptomatic or develop symptoms gradually over many years. Pathophys and etiology. Mitral regurgitation is associated with rheumatic carditis and mitral valve prolapse. It is also linked with damage to the papillary muscles, impaired myocardial function after a heart attack, connective tissue disorders, stretching of the valve opening from an enlarged left ventricle, and malfunction of a replaced valve. It can also develop after balloon valvuloplasty and use of the weight loss drugs identified in the discussion of aortic regurgitation has also been associated with mitral valve regurgitation. When the mitral valve becomes incompetent, it does not close completely. Blood flows backward into the left atrium during ventricular systole and leaks into the left ventricle during atrial diastole. The heart usually can compensate for a small amount of blood that is regurgitated backward and forward by increasing the size of the left ventricle and left atria. The larger size facilitates ejection of blood from the heart, in which case pulmonary congestion does not occur. If the regurgitation occurs rapidly, however, the heart is less able to compensate. Forward output from the left ventricle is diminished and the client develops sign of cardiogenic shock. Accumulation of blood in the left atrium results in pulmonary congestion. The client typically experiences chronic fatigue and shortness of breath on exertion. Heart palpitations may occur caused by the forceful contraction of the left ventricle as it attempts to empty the excess blood from its chamber. The S1 heart sound is diminished because of incomplete closure of the mitral valve. An S3 heart sound, if heard, is an early sign of impending heart failure. Hypertension may develop when reduced cardiac output triggers the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cycle. Tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism when stroke volume decreases. A loud blowing murmur often is heard throughout ventricular systole at the heart's apex. If pulmonary congestion occurs, the client develops shortness of breath and moist lung sounds typical of left ventricular failure. Many clients with mitral valve prolapse are asymptomatic. When symptoms are present, they include chest pain, palpitations, and fatigue. The chest pain differs from that of angina. It does, its onset does not correlate with physical exertion. Its duration is longer lasting, and it is not easily relieved. Some clients also experience symptoms that resemble anxiety or panic, such as a rapid and irregular heart rate, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, difficulty concentrating, and fear that the symptoms indicate impending death. Auscultation of heart sounds reveals a characteristic click during ventricular systole caused by tightening of the chordae tendinae. A systolic murmur is associated with mitral regurgitation. The presumptive diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse is strong if the murmur disappears or diminishes when the client squats during auscultation. Additional symptoms of mitral regurgitation also may be manifested. Echocardiography shows abnormal movement of one or more mitral valve leaflets during systole. The electrocardiogram EKG, resting, exercise, chemical, or ambulatory, is essentially normal, eliminating a heart attack as a cause for the chest pain. EKG, however, may detect other causes. Medical and surgical management. Many clients with mitral valve prolapse require no treatment. Such drugs as digitalis, digoxin, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers control tachy dysrhythmias. All of those drugs 
control hypertension except digitalis. Medications to reduce or inhibit platelet aggregation in cases where mitral valve prolapse is accompanied by atrial fibrillation include a single daily low-dose aspirin, warfarin, which is Coumadin, clopidogrel, which is Plavix, to prevent thrombus formation. If symptoms become severe, valve replacement is indicated. Anti-anxiety medication may be prescribed to prevent symptoms related to the sympathetic nervous system among those with mitral valve prolapse syndrome. Such clients also are advised to avoid caffeine to prevent tachycardia and heart palpitations. To compensate for symptoms associated with hypovolemia, liberal fluid and adequate sodium intake is recommended. Because alcohol can suppress antidiuretic hormone, ADH, leading to loss of extracellular fluid, clients with mitral valve prolapse syndrome are advised to restrict or eliminate its use. How dehydrating is an alcoholic drink? A shot of alcohol produces an additional 120 milliliters of urine. That means one eight ounce beer will make a person urinate about 14 ounces of fluid. Nursing management. One measure to relieve chest pain is to have the client lie flat with the legs elevated and supported against a wall or couch at a 90 degree angle for three to five minutes to facilitate, facilitate volume changes in the heart. Other recommendations include increasing activity when tachycardia occurs to eliminate the initiation of extra ineffective beats to make up for reduced cardiac output and lower levels of catecholamines. To relax or decrease shortness of breath, the nurse instructs the client to breathe deeply and slowly and then exhale through pursed lips. Client teaching also includes instructions to avoid caffeinated beverages and over-the-counter medications that contain stimulating chemicals to avoid contributing to an already rapid heart rate. If hypertension is not a problem, the nurse encourages the client to drink adequate fluids and continue moderate use of salt to maintain intravascular fluid volume. Alcohol is discouraged, however, because of its dehydrating effects and because withdrawal after chronic use can cause cardiac stimulation. The nurse warns clients who are prescribed minor tranquilizers not to stop the medication abruptly or they may experience stimulating withdrawal symptoms. Nursing management. The nurse closely monitors blood pressure, heart rate, and rhythm, heart sounds, and lung sounds. If sodium is restricted, the nurse works with the client and dietitian to find seasonings and foods and weighs the client to determine changes in fluid volume. He or she administers medications to treat symptoms and report signs of left or right-sided heart failure immediately. The nurse emphasizes the need for prophylactic antibiotics and periodic health assessments. Mitral valve prolapse. In mitral valve prolapse, the valve cusps enlarge, become floppy, and bulge backward into the left atrium. Mitral regurgitation may occur, but not in all cases. Mitral valve prolapse is a leading cause of mitral regurgitation. It's more common in young women than men. Despite its high incidence, it is considered to be a benign disease for most affected people. Pathophysiology and etiology. The cause of mitral valve prolapse is not completely understood and it's often classified as idiopathic, which means having no known cause. It's also been suggested that the tissue changes res result from an inherited connective tissue disorder that affects the mitral valve and other connective tissues in the body. It's been observed that some clients develop mitral valve prolapse in association with coronary artery disease, although they're not sure. There is, however, strong evidence that mitral valve prolapse accompanies the valvular changes of rheumatic carditis and structural changes predispose the valve to further damage if infective endocarditis develops. Some people develop mitral valve prolapse syndrome. Symptoms that cannot be attributed to valvular disease alone. It's associated with autonomic nervous system dysfunction. This association may explain why some clients have increased levels of catecholamines, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, abnormal catecholamines regulation, and decreased intravascular volume, which causes symptoms that mimic severe anxiety, tachycardia, palpitations, breathlessness, and dizziness. Decreased circulatory volume may contribute to the client's, asympt the client's symptomology by triggering an abnormal 
renin angiotensin aldosterone response. Changes in the mitral valve tissue layers cause the cusps to distend. The billowing cusps stretch the papillary muscles as the balloon as they balloon backward into the left atrium. The stretching of the papillary muscles causes <clears throat> local ischemia and atypical chest pain. As the papillary muscles provide less support to the mitral valve, valvular incompetence occurs. The left atrium and ventricle eventually may enlarge and subsequently progress to heart failure. Assessment findings. Many clients with mitral valve prolapse are asymptomatic. When symptoms are present, they include chest pain, palpitations, and fatigue. The chest pain differs from that of angina. Its onset does not correlate with physical exertion, its duration is longer, and it is not easily relieved. Some clients also experience symptoms that resemble anxiety or panic, such as rapid and irregular heart rate, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, difficulty concentrating, and fear that the symptoms indicate impending death. Auscultation of heart sounds reveals a characteristic click during ventricular systole caused by tightening of the cord cordae tendonite. A systolic murmur is associated with mitral regurgitation. The presumptive diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse is strong if the murmur disappears or diminishes when the client squats during auscultation. Additional symptoms of mitral regurgitation also may be manifested. Echocardiography shows abnormal movement of one or more mitral valve leaflets during systole. The electrocardiogram done resting exercise chemical or ambulatory is essentially normal, eliminating, the, eliminating an MI as a result for the chest pain. EKG, however, may detect other causes. Medical and surgical management. Many clients with mitral valve prolapse require no treatment. Such drugs as digitalis, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers control tachydysrhythmias. All of them except digitalis control hypertension. Medications to reduce or inhibit platelet aggregation in cases where mitral valve prolapse is accompanied by atrial fibrillation includes a single daily low dose aspirin, warfarin or coumadin, clopidogrel or plavix to prevent thrombus formation. If symptoms become severe, valve replacement is indicated. Anti-anxiety medication may be prescribed to prevent symptoms related to the sympathetic nervous system among those with mitral valve prolapse syndrome. Such clients are also advised to avoid caffeine to prevent tachycardia and heart palpitations. To compensate for symptoms associated with hypovolemia, liberal fluid and adequate sodium intake is, rec is recommended. Because alcohol can suppress antidiuretic hormone, ADH, leading to loss of extracellular fluid, clients with mitral valve prolapse syndrome are advised to restrict or eliminate its use. How dehydrating is an alcoholic drink? A shot of alcohol produces an additional 120 milliliters of urine. That means one eight ounce beer will make a person urinate about 14 ounces of fluid. Nursing management. One measure to relieve chest pain is to have the client lie flat with the legs elevated and supported against a wall or couch at a 90 degree angle for three to five minutes to help facilitate volume changes in the heart. Other recommendations include increasing activity when tachycardia occurs to eliminate the initiation of extra ineffective beats and make up for reduced cardiac output and lower levels of catecholamines. To relax or decrease shortness of breath, the nurse instructs the client to breathe deeply and slowly and then exhale through pursed lips. Client teaching also includes instructions to avoid caffeinated beverages and over-the-counter medications that contain stimulating chemicals to avoid contributing to an already rapid heart rate. If hypertension is not a problem, the nurse encourages the client to drink adequate fluids and continue moderate use of salt to maintain intravascular fluid volume. Alcohol is discouraged because of its dehydrating effects and because withdrawal after chronic use can cause cardiac stimulation. 
The nurse warns clients who are prescribed minor tranquilizers not to stop the medication abruptly or they may experience stimulating withdrawal symptoms. Question. A client has possible diagnosis of mitral stenosis. Which of the following symptoms correlate with this diagnosis? Is it heart murmur? Is it heart failure? Palpitations? Or pulmonary edema? So the answer has three answers, heart murmurs, palpitations, and pulmonary edema. All of the following are symptoms caused by the stricture of the mitral valve, stricture meaning narrowing. Heart failure may be a complication of the disease. So heart murmur, palpitations, and pulmonary, pulmonary edema are symptoms. This is the end of the slideshow.